Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone and today we are going to discuss the life and career of one of the most enduring, beloved and perhaps the most controversial of Hollywood legends, Joan Crawford. Joining me today is a lifelong fan and administrator of the Joan Crawford Hollywood Royalty Facebook page, Jeff Kenny. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Jeff, what is it about Joan Crawford that made you become such a devoted fan? Well, I, I think it's all, it all began when I, when I saw Mommy Dearest uh, as a young kid. I believe I was probably about 14 years old. I had no idea who Joan Crawford was. I had never heard of her. But when I watched the movie, I just, became, I just kind of became obsessed with her, pretty much. I needed to find out everything I could about her. I just found her fascinating. What made you decide to create a Facebook page dedicated to her? Well, I, I decided to create that when Feud came out. There were so many kind of misconceptions about her. A lot of fans really didn't know about Joan Crawford except for Mommy Dearest. And I kind of just wanted to create a page that was positive about her and something that wasn't negative or a caricature of her. Can you define what it is about Joan Crawford that drew you to her? Mainly that she was a self-made movie star. You know, she came from nothing, pretty much. And I found that just over the years, I just found that fascinating that someone could take herself from really, from a very poor, humble beginning and make herself into a huge, huge star all over the world. I just thought that was so fascinating about her. So when you watched Mommy Dearest and then decided to explore where did you start? What did you start watching? Was it her old movies that you went to right away? Uh, well, you know, at that time, I mean, I mean, I was very young. I was probably 14 years old. So, I mean, there wasn't really any way for me to really find out about Joan Crawford except go to the library. And I think there were maybe about two books on Joan. Uh, I checked those out, read up on her. But, you know, even at that time, you know, cable wasn't around. I think we had three TV channels, I think, when I was a kid. So even her movies, I had no idea what her movies were. One afternoon, I just happened to catch a Joan Crawford movie. I wasn't even for certain it was her, but I thought it was. Uh, and it was Straight Jacket. As I was watching it, I thought to myself, this looks like the woman who is in Mommy Dearest, but I wasn't, I didn't know until the credits rolled that it, it was her. And so I was mesmerized by that. So there really wasn't any way for me to really find out about Joan Crawford until way, you know, way later on when, you know, a lot of books started to be written about her, her movies were being shown on television. That's how I really kind of became knowledgeable of her. You know, when I start my day, I love a great cup of coffee to get me going. Recently, I've discovered a new blend that has a really delicious flavor profile, rich and bold with hints of nuts, cocoa, and soft spices. As you know from watching our show, I love the golden age of Hollywood and the legendary stars of that era. And this coffee, named after one of my all-time favorite movie stars, Joan Crawford, called the Joan Crawford Grand Hotel Blend, is produced by a terrific company, Breakfast at Dominique's. They've created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of many legendary stars. Breakfast at Dominique's uses only high quality vegan, sugar-free and gluten-free ground coffee that's organic and follows fair trade practices. And that's important to me. Offering better trading conditions to coffee bean farmers, supporting producers and sustainable environmental farming practices that prohibit child or forced labor creates opportunities for sustainable development that helps our planet. Not only is the coffee delicious, it's beautifully packaged and makes a great gift for friends, especially those who are classic movie buffs. If you're looking for a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try. You can order the Joan Crawford blend or any of the other coffees named after some of the greatest cinematic legends at hollywoodblends.com. To tell you the truth, I even feel glamorous when I'm drinking it. Why not have a cup while you're watching our show and add a touch of Hollywood to your day?
One of the things that is so remarkable about Joan Crawford is the sheer longevity of her career. She made her first movie, a silent picture, in 1925, and her last movie was made in 1970, and her last TV show was in 1972. What do you think made her so popular for so many years? I think that she was able to create herself or recreate herself in every decade. So if you look at the 20s all the way up to the 70s, every decade that she is in, she looks totally different. And I think that she progressed through time. I think one thing that, that kind of kept audiences captivated with her is that it's like she never really kind of aged. I mean, she did as she got older, uh, maybe in the 60s, 70s, but it was always Joan Crawford. Every, I mean, every movie was always Joan Crawford. You knew what you were going to get when you watched a Joan Crawford movie. What were you going to get? Can you define it? You know, I don't know if you can really define what you were going to get, but, you know, when you watch her on, on film, she's just mesmerizing. I mean, you can't, you can't take your eyes off of her. No matter what scene she's in, if she's in with a ensemble cast, you know, in a scene, your eyes go to Joan. It, it doesn't matter if it's Clark Gable or if, for me, if it's Betty Davis. I mean, you still zero in on her. So, you know, and then also, you know, there's just the clothing, uh, her, her beauty, her glamour, anything that you would want in, in Joan Crawford, you're definitely going to get when you watch a Joan Crawford movie. Do you have a favorite Joan Crawford film? Well, it's hard for me to, to really narrow it down to one. I have a top three. Okay. It's, it's Dance Fools Dance from 19, I think, 31, Female on the Beach, and Sudden Fear. And then I also have a really high regard. I just love Torch Song. I watch it every Sunday. I might not watch it, but I play it, and I listen to it pretty much every Sunday. I'm amazed that you didn't mention the movies that are most commonly connected to her, uh, Mildred Pierce and Baby Jane. Well, it's not that I don't, that I don't like those. I do. I, I like those very much. In fact, I used to watch Whatever Happened to Baby Jane constantly. But, and Mildred Pierce I love as well. I mean, it's just, it's phenomenal. But there's just something about, especially Fema on the Beach for me, that I just, that I love. Uh, I love the dialogue in it. I love how she looks in it. I love how she acts in it. And then Sudden Fear for me, you know, there's so many scenes in that film where she has absolutely no dialogue. I mean, through a lot of the film, because, you know, she's planning a murder, basically. But you can't stop watching her and her facial expressions, how she handles every scene. Her acting in, in Sudden Fear is just superb. And then Dance Fools Dance, I really don't know why I like it so much, but the fact that she's so young in it, you know, she's young, she's cute. You can tell she's just having a blast making that film. And then they threw Clark Gable in. And I really think you can tell if you really watch it, she is mesmerized by him. So th those are the kind of the reasons why I love, I love those three. But I mean, I love Mildred Pierce. I just watched it the other day. Can I tell you my two favorite Joan Crawford movies? Yes, definitely. Autumn Leaves, because I, okay. found, I found her very vulnerable in that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a tenderness. It wasn't the really strong Joan Crawford that comes across in many others like Flamingo Road. And then the other one I really love is the second movie by the name of Possessed, because she made two movies with that name. But the right. second mm -hmm. one dealt yeah. also with a very fragile, emotionally turbulent Joan Crawford. Did you like yes. those two movies? Yes, very much so. I mean, I love Possessed. I mean, she she plays, you know, a psychotic better than anybody. And even in that movie, like you said, in Autumn Leaves, she was very, very fragile in, in Possessed. I mean, she was ready to snap at any moment. And you really didn't know when she was going to snap. But yes, I, I love both of those. Do you have a least favorite movie? Yes, I do. Uh, I have several. Oh, I, several. I don't know. You have several. Yeah. Yes. 
Well, I don't like Above Suspicion. That's one of her last, one of the last films she made at MGM. I've watched it several times. And to be honest, I don't understand what's going on in the movie. It just has so many plots. And, you know, they're supposed to be Nazis or, or undercover Nazis or something along with the war. And I just didn't understand it. And I, I don't care for it. I don't like the Union in France with John Wayne. I like it over above suspicion. Joan said publicly that her least favorite movie was This Woman is Dangerous, which I absolutely mm -hmm. loved. What did you think of that film? I think it's kind of boring. I don't think she liked it very much. And, you know, some of the films that she doesn't like, I, I tend to not like either because I know she doesn't like them. So I think sometimes when when stars, you know, when stars make a movie, they really shouldn't tell their public, you know, the films they don't like because you tend to not like them too, or you like them so much and then you're crushed that they didn't like it. But I don't know. I mean, it's okay. I just found it kind of boring. Well, I think some movie stars decide how they like the movie based on what kind of experience they had making it. And if they mm -hmm. didn't enjoy making it, they end up not liking the movie. And I think that's what happened with Joan's assessment of this woman is dangerous. Do you think that's possible? I think so. I mean, yeah, absolutely. She didn't really like Rain very much, um, but I mean, I think it's excellent. I don't know what kind of experience she had on it, but I mean, in interviews or uh, when asked about it, she doesn't really have great things to say about Rain, but I think it's great. Yeah, I do too. Who do you think was her best leading man? Probably Clark Gable, more than likely. I really like the fact that I think that they were in love with each other or maybe she was in love with him. So when I watch it, I try to find maybe particular scenes to where maybe you can kind of tell that they really, you know, do care for each other. There's a couple scenes in uh, Dancing Lady that she looks at him uh, like he's probably the best thing on earth. So I think probably Clark more than likely. I think she says that too. She made a movie with Clark Gable called Strange Cargo. It wasn't highly successful, but I mm -hmm. find that movie mesmerizing. And the chemistry between the two of them is exactly what you were talking about. Right. I will watch Strange Cargo sometimes when it comes on. You know, you really can't figure out who the vehicle is for, if it's really for Joan or if it's really for Clark. And I think maybe that was one of the first films that she allowed herself to kind of look not so glamorous, kind of rolled around in the mud, got dirty, you know, no makeup, but probably the latter part of the movie. But yeah, I love, I love Strange Cargo. A lot of people don't. They think it's incredibly boring. There was another movie where she allowed herself not to look glamorous, and that was A Woman's Face. Did you like that movie? I love that movie. I, I just absolutely love it. I particularly love probably the first hour of that movie before she goes to to take care of the little boy in Switzerland, I think, when she still had the scar on her face. You know, you had really seen Jim Crawford be kind of evil until then. So, I mean, it was quite a departure from a lot of the movies that she was playing up until then. I mean, she was the shot girl. She was the girl that was, you know, was struggling to make it that you were rooting for. And in a woman's face, it was kind of the opposite. I mean, she was going to go up there and, and take care of this little boy. So different. And her, just her speech pattern in that movie in the very beginning is so different than what you're used to. You know, very low speaking voice, very slow. And I don't know if that was something that they were leading, you know, were leading up to, but I love it. Much has been said about Joan's failure to attend the 1946 Academy Awards where she won the Best Actress Award for Mildred Pierce. Do you think she was really sick or was she just too scared to show up? I think that she was probably too sick or not, not sick. I don't think she wanted to show up. I don't think she probably, I don't know if she really thought that she was probably going to win, even though there was a lot of buzz that she was going to win. But I think that she didn't want to have the embarrassment of being there and not winning and being in a room full of, you know, Hollywood peers who may have looked down upon her. And I don't think she wanted to have to deal with that. So what better way just to say you're sick and 
stay home. All right. This is the most controversial part of our interview, but we have to go there because no interview about Joan Crawford would be complete without discussing Mommy Dearest, the explosive book written by Joan's daughter, Christina, in 1978, published right after her mother died. We will deal with the book and the movie, but I want to start with the book. What did you think of it? I, I really don't believe in a lot of it. You know, the only two people that know what happened in that house and what transpired between those two is Joan and Christina. Uh, Joan is dead and Christina definitely has her opinion and that's fine. But I don't know if I, I do believe that there's probably some definite, definite truth into some of it. I don't believe all of it. You know, I do believe that Joan was probably a very, very strict mother, probably a lot of discipline, um, probably a lot of rules that I don't think probably Christina wanted to deal with or put up with. I think she wanted to be a, a Hollywood spoiled kid, and I don't think Joan was going to have it. You know, jo Joan came from very humble beginnings, very poor, and I don't think she wanted to just hand off, you know, a lot of money or, or not to have to do things, uh, take care of yourself to Christina. I mean, that's just my opinion, but I really think that Joan was trying to set all her children up for success. Christina, Christopher, Kathy, and Cindy. Um, you know, Kathy and Cindy say the total opposite of what Christina has said. Again, I think there's probably some truth and Joan was probably very strict and maybe a point to where maybe she was too strict. I don't know. Like I said, I wasn't there. Only they were. So only those, only those two know the answer to that. But I just don't think that Christina probably appreciated it very much that Joan wasn't letting her be like a Hollywood spoiled kid like a lot of stars were. Well, Joan had a horrible childhood filled with neglect yes. and abuse. She probably never had a chance to learn how to be a good parent. And most studies tell us that we learn how to be a good parent from the way we were parented. So does that factor into your analysis at all? Maybe a little bit. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's so hard to say. I mean, I know that she grew up very poor and, and there was probably a lot of abuse uh, going on with her uh, as a child, as a young girl. You know, I just, I don't understand how one, one child can, can say all this happened, but the other, you know, the other two, the twins, say the total opposite. So I don't, I don't understand how there's such a divide between the family. So, you know, I don't know. Well, are you persuaded at all by the fact that Joan's son, Christopher, supported Christina's allegations, even though the twins didn't? Well, I'm not surprised by it. I mean, they were, they were both kind of in the same time frame of each other. I don't really know their age difference. But I mean, I know they were both there, you know, pretty much together. Some of the things that I do have read about Christopher, I mean, he was a very problem child. He ran away, you know, uh, I think caused a lot of problems for Joan, you know, but you know, when you, when you cut somebody out of a will and cut them out of, out of what they probably think is their due, you're going to get even, uh, especially if you think that you're owed money and notoriety. So I think there were some definite, definite probably conversations between Christina and Christopher together, let's get our story straight before we start this. Well, I think it's important to point out that Joan was not the only Hollywood star whose child wrote a disparaging book about her. Bing Crosby's right. son and Betty Davis's daughter and Shirley MacLaine's daughter each wrote very negative books about their parents. What did you think of the movie, Mommy Dearest, and Faye Dunaway's portrayal of Joan? Well, you know, when I first saw Mommy Dearest, I mean, I didn't have anything to go off of. So, you know, I, like I said before, I didn't know who Joan Crawford was. I just saw this crazed, you know, woman. And I just, I didn't quite understand it. And I kind of was wondering, I mean, is this person really like this? That's why I really kind of wanted to try to find out as much as I could about her. You know, you don't know if it's really the director's fault, her fault, why they portrayed her that way. I think they were kind of going off of the book. You know, maybe if they had done some research and maybe did some interviews with some of Joan's friends, uh, maybe the outcome would have been different. 
I don't know why they made her so kind of crazed. Who knows? Does it make you sad as a Joan Crawford fan that her public image and reputation will forever have a cloud over it because of Mommy Dearest? It doesn't really make me sad. Uh, you know, there's it's kind of a double sword there with Mommy Dearest. I mean, you know, you have to, when you watch the movie, you have to decide for yourself what you think is true. Uh, there's so much information at, you know, at your fingertips that you can find out on your own if you really want to. Uh, you know, a lot of Joan's friends say the total opposite about her. But like I said, it's a double-edged sword with Mommy Dearest. I mean, that's what brought me to love her and find out about her. And I think without the movie, I don't really know if Joan would be somebody that people would clamor to find out about. I don't know, but that's why I'm here. So I want to move on from the whole Mommy Dearest discussion, but first I want to say to our viewers that the book is worth reading, so you can decide for yourselves what to make of it. I can tell you that my heart went out to Christina when I read her book. I think it's important, in all fairness, to point out that numerous celebrities who knew Joan well have come out on both sides of the debate. Everyone has their opinions, and this is an interview, not an investigation. But I do think it's possible to separate Joan's body of work from her personal life. And in this program, we are primarily focusing on her career. So with that being said, let's move on. Joan was well known for being almost obsessively devoted to her fans. She personally answered every single fan letter throughout her entire life. It has been estimated that she wrote more than a half million letters to fans throughout her career. Jeff, don't you think that's just amazing? I think that's so amazing. I don't know of any star from that era who did that. And I really think that Joan realized the importance of doing that. I mean, it kept people mesmerized by her. I mean, can you imagine going out to your mailbox and getting a letter from Joan Crawford? I mean, that would be just absolutely incredible. And you know, and she didn't just stop with one. I mean, she would continue to write people over and over. I mean, you send her a card, she's going to send something back to you. I mean, it just went on and on. I don't know if it ever stopped. I mean, I think she was doing that up until she died. So, I mean, name, I mean, I don't know of any star past or present who would actually sit down and handwrite a thank you card. I mean, I can't think of anyone. Can you? No, I, the rumor was that she would even send thank you notes to thank you for a thank you note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you're right. What did you think of the 2017 Ryan Murphy miniseries Feud, Betty and Joan? Mm -hmm. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think I've seen it about five times. I just recently finished watching it probably about a month ago again. And I mean, I was mesmerized by it like the very first time I watched it. You know, when the first time it came on, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't wait for it to come on. You know, I just, I wanted to see a different side of, of Joan. I wanted to see somebody else portray her. Um, well, what did you think of Jessica Lange's portrayal of Joan Crawford? I think she did an amazing job. I loved her as Joan Crawford. I almost see Jessica Lange now as Joan Crawford. I've, <laughs> I, I have moved Jessica Lange up the pedestal <laughs> to like the height of, of, of me liking an actress. I mean, I'm putting her right up there with Joan Crawford and Katherine Hepburn. Right now, Jessica Lange can do absolutely no wrong, in my opinion. But I love the fact that she brought something different to Joan, portraying Joan. She made her a real-life person, not a caricature. Gave her, you know, so much depth. You know, very, uh, just, she was all over the place with, with Joan. Made her, you know, very vulnerable, uh, hard as nails, calculating and then very insecure. I mean, portrayed her as a very insecure woman, which I loved. I mean, I loved to know that she was insecure, you know, um, and had many demons with her about Joan. 
So I loved it. What did you think of Susan Sarandon's portrayal of Betty Davis? I loved it as well. I mean, I thought that she nailed, she nailed it too. I mean, she really did. I mean, the speech pattern, I just thought she did a great job. But of course, I, mean, I was more interested in, in, in Joan, but I loved Susan's portrayal of Betty. I mean, when you watch that, you almost think you are watching Betty Davis and Joan. So if you do that, I mean, you've pretty much done your job. Betty Davis used to complain that the number one question she would be asked by interviewers and fans was what did she really think of Joan Crawford? In her 1987 book, This and That, Miss Davis devoted an entire chapter to Joan Crawford. What did you think of what Betty Davis had to say? You know, she really wouldn't come out and say too much negative things about Joan. I mean, there are some interviews later on that she discusses Joan, maybe not in so favorable way, but a lot of interviews, she says she's very professional. She was on time. She knew her lines. She would also say how beautiful she was, uh, that she didn't want to take that, take anything away from her as far as her professionalism, knowing her lines and showing up on time. I think they were totally two different actresses, even though they were from the same time frame, just totally different. I mean, Joan was very Hollywood, you know, loved, loved the Hollywood scene. I don't think Betty did. I think she was, you know, she was from New England. She was country, you know, from the country. I don't think she really cared too much about the Hollywood scene like Joan did. And I don't think she liked those type of actresses, but do I think they liked each other? Uh, probably not. I think Joan tried. I think she wanted maybe Betty as a friend and Betty just wasn't interested. Betty Davis publicly criticized Joan Crawford for campaigning against her so she wouldn't win the Academy Award for whatever happened to baby Jane. As you know, Joan orchestrated things so she would be there to accept the Best Actress Oscar on behalf of Anne Bancroft. Do you have an opinion as to whether Joan really did contribute to Betty Davis losing the Oscar? I really can't say. Um, I would like to think that Joan would not do something like that. You know, she was hurting herself financially because they were, you know, they took a percentage of the profits. So if Betty had won an Oscar, uh, that would have meant, uh, you know, a bigger box office. So I don't know if she did. But you have to wonder, I mean, Betty was nominated for an Oscar, Joan wasn't. Could I see her maybe calling up some people and maybe trying to persuade them uh, not to vote for her? Uh, probably so. But uh, I mean, according to Betty, she called up everybody in Hollywood and asked for them not to vote for her, called up the nominees and, and said, if you don't, if you're not president, I'll pick up the award for you. And she did. You know, nobody, nobody steals an Oscar like Joan does, that's for sure. <laughs> well, for whatever it's worth, I think that Anne Bancroft's performance in the Helen Keller movie did deserve the Oscar more than Betty Davis did. What do you think? Well, you know what? I just watched The Girl Co-Worker uh, about a week ago, and I hadn't seen it in a really, really long time. And I was mesmerized by Anne Bancroft's performance. And as we were sitting there watching it, I actually said, I said, can you believe that, and, I, and I'm not saying anything about Betty's performance in Baby Jane because it's, it's great, but I said, I can't believe that Betty thought that she was going to win over Anne Bancroft. I don't know why she would think that. It's two entirely different performances, um, and Anne Bancroft's performance in that was so strong and riveting, and I mean, she really drew you in to, you know, playing Annie Sullivan, so... It was great. So I think it was very well deserved and I'm glad she won. What did you think of Joan Crawford's 1971 autobiography, My Way of Life? Well, I, I, I like it. Um, I mean, it has some really interesting uh, household hints, I guess, how to keep things clean, how to keep your uh, behind firm. Don't sit on cushions that are soft. Uh, or, you know, her Bloody Mary recipes in it her meatloaf recipes in it. She talks about throwing, you know, how to have a successful dinner party. You know, you need a doctor, a lawyer, uh, your visiting relatives from Brussels to be successful. 
I, I, I love it. I mean, I think it's, it's a lot of fun to read. So then I must ask you, do you do what Joan does and throw a splash of vodka into everything without the guests knowing it? Absolutely. <laughs> and does it work? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I got the impression reading Joan's book that she was revealing her personality as she had carefully constructed it to be. I always felt that from the time she got to Hollywood in the 20s, she had to reinvent herself as a cultured, sophisticated person and that no one ever really knew who the real Joan Crawford was. What do you think? I mean, I definitely think that people probably didn't really truly know who Joan was. You know, it's kind of hard to say how she was behind closed doors with personal friends of hers. You know, when you watch interviews with her, they seem so staged. You know, the questions, I'm sure she probably got the questions ahead of time. It's like she practiced her answer, which I'm sure she did, which is fine. I think she didn't want to come off as um, unsure, uneducated, didn't know what she was talking about. Um, I think she wanted to control her image, you know, to the very last detail, you know, and she was, like I said earlier, you know, she was self-made and she did reinvent herself every decade. You know, Madonna does that. You know, I don't know really what she was truly like behind closed doors. But, you know, the interviews that she does, um, it's really hard to say. You just don't really know who you're, who you're going to get in an interview. There's some great interviews, though, that she's done that you can watch on YouTube uh, that I love. If a person wanted to read a book about Joan Crawford's life and career, which book would you recommend? Uh, there's two I'd recommend. One is from Bob Thomas, and then one is from Fred Lawrence Giles. Uh, the last word. Uh, they're both very, very good. They go into a lot of detail uh, about Joan's life, especially the Bob Thomas book. It goes from, you know, from the very beginning to the very end. It's very detailed. Um, you'd learn a lot about Joan and also the Fred Warren Styles book, The Last Word. But there's also a really, really great book from Carl Jones called Joan Crawford's The Final Years. And it's about his friendship that he had with Joan later on in life. That's really interesting. It almost sounds like they were very close friends. It's a little sad. It definitely portrays her as a lonely lady. It's sad that if that's what truly was going on with her, how really sad that is that, you know, you had this huge star like Joan Crawford who you would think that would just have friends all over the place, constantly coming around. But in that book, that doesn't seem to be the case. It's really sad. Joan Crawford has a huge gay following. So does Betty Davis, Judy Garland, Marilyn Monroe, Barbara Stanwyck, many other strong Hollywood divas. Why do you think gay men love these women so much? I think it's because they were always trying to get ahead, always having to fight for what is theirs or what they think is theirs. Um, and I think a lot of gay men do that on a daily basis. They're larger than life. The glamor, the clothing, the dialogue that comes out of these ladies' mouths are, are, are priceless. But I really think it's that, you know, they're, they're having to fight for pretty much everything in almost every movie. So I think, they, so I think gay men can relate to that very well. Now, you never got to meet Joan Crawford, but if you could have met her, what would you have said to her? I don't know what I, I don't know what I would be able to say to her. I don't know if I could even get it out. I would probably have to just tell her how much I love her and how much joy she has brought to my life as far as watching her movies. I mean, I can totally escape when I watch a Joan Crawford movie. I watch two or three a week. Some I watch this, the same ones over and over. Um, I would just have to let her know that how much I appreciate what she has brought to me. I just, just love her. Well, Jeff, I have really enjoyed this chat with you and I hope that all the Joan Crawford fans out there have enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for being on our show. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Our guest has been Jeff Kenny. I am Harvey Brownstone. 
Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel and be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on harveybrownstoneinterviews.com.